Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. We're going to get started. I'm hoping that the people in the hallway can hear me. Uh, unfortunately, we do need to start. We're already a little bit behind. Uh, I do have one question. Is Sherry Dominey in the room? Right there. Uh, I do have something very important to say that Bill, uh, Jim Dow is not the farthest west, is he? No, no. <laughs> yes, he is. Are you? Who's farther west? Farther west than Buxton? I think Kate Rozier and Castillo is further west than. Well, I, do, I just want to do a shout out. No, 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 no. I meant for the panel discussion. Uh, Great Pond, Mountain. Yes. Uh, they also do work as well, so I don't want anyone to think that it just stops at Blue Hill Heritage Trust. Is there another land trust over by Bucksport? No, but there's one in Deer Isle. Oh, yes, Deer Isle. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Our next speaker is Josh Roy from the Nature Conservancy, and I want to remind everyone that, again, we started big picture with a little bit of history and some context and why we should be doing large landscape conservation and um, all the benefits of it, and now we're looking at tools for it. So here we are, Josh Roy. Does that mean you can hear me? There we go. Delay. I must be in a different time zone. So um, it sounds loud to me, so I'll try to keep it down. So this is my quiet voice. Is it still working? So I'm going to talk about conservation planning that we do, which starts at a global scale, and we translate it down to a local scale using a variety of tools that are usable at, at many different scales, the same tools, same data layers we use and dumb down, if you will, or, or, or uh, splice them up into smaller tools for local conservation planning. So a little bit about us, that we work around the world to conserve lands on which all uh, life depends. And these are not just lands, but they are waters, fresh water and salt water as well. We work in a lot of different places, we protect a lot of land, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. But just so you know that we have a lot of scientific staff, so even though you may see me up here and, uh, and other staff of the Nature Conservancy, we have a wealth of staff around the world that we can tap into for problems that may be very similar to the problems that you're facing in your geography or your service area. Um, so our challenge now is look at what are the most promising ways that we can make changes in Maine that will protect the natural diversity that we have here, the full suite of natural communities and ecosystems and species that also help protect, uh, protect our natural infrastructure and, and, and help people's livelihoods. And this is how we work. We, start, uh, we work both from the bottom up, collecting data on the ground. We used to do a lot of ground uh, work ourselves. Now a lot more of that is done by uh, the Natural Areas Program and IFNW. Um, but we also start globally, and, and I'll show you an example as we move along. We start at major habitat types. And we move down to eco-regions, which Andy was showing you, and then we sort of look at, uh, within Maine, our own ecological regions and our, our, our work on the ground, which works to ensure areas are protected, that we restore them if they're, if they're in poor shape now, and we reduce threats so that, it's, so that you make sure that even after you've done changes, you've done protection, you've done conservation or restoration, that it stays that way. You keep, have to keep uh, vigilant for other outside threats manage consistently and, and, and we need to measure success. So that's the, the other part is that not only are our strategies working, but the threats, we're keeping an eye on them to make sure they're not creeping back in and degrading our resources. And thirdly, we need to make sure that our conservation objectives, the land, the waters, the fish themselves are, are remaining where, the way we thought they would. Otherwise, we might need to re rejigger our, uh, our strategies or our threat assessments. So for example, here's a global resource, is this broadleaf coniferous forest, which we live in here, and many of us have lived our whole lives in this, in this ecosystem that's, sorry, this large functional system that's uh, outlined in black around the world. 
And if you look at the scale from lots of human impact to very little human impact, and the fly isn't part of my presentation, so mine is the red dot, the, that fly. I'd like to blind them, but that, only temporarily, of course. But. So here's, here's the northern, these northern forests that we love with our broadleaves. There's little bits going down the coast of Chile. And um, if you look around the world, these places like China and Europe, there's an awful lot of red. These are not great places to protect things that are intact. There are good places to restore them, which is very costly and very difficult uh, time-wise, and it's always a struggle. But if you look here, if I can hold my hands steady enough with the iced tea in me, you can see that Maine and, and New Brunswick, this area called the Northern Appalachian Acadian ecoregion, and I'll show you in the next slide that area, is actually very in touch, uh, intact. And, and it's, um, you can see that in this view of, of Earth at night, going from the Adirondacks over to Nova Scotia, that there's not a lot of lights here. It's a little bit here in a, in a northern, northwestern, sorry, that's over in Quebec. Um, but for the most part, this is the landscape that we live in. And as far as us working together, it, it speaks to me of a larger imperative that is, it's not just protecting our own backyards, which a lot of us do best. That's where most conservation begins and sometimes ends. But it's really for the larger good of the planet as we think about areas that we're protecting and how much of this is still intact here. So here's another view of the human view, uh, footprint and kind of a blow up area showing uh, this resilience data layer, which shows a lot of the Down East region is being not only very resilient in terms of the land being intact, but also very connected, as you can see, to landscapes to the north and east, and of course out to the Gulf of Maine, which is very important as well. Ooh. So this is how we do our conservation planning once we decide on a place. We define our project, which includes a vision. Hopefully you're developing a team at the same time. If you de develop a vision for your project in absence of your team, you might have trouble getting buy-in. If you develop it with your team, if you develop your, your idea of what your objectives are and what the threats are with your team, moving through the process is gonna be a lot easier. So a lot of times when you're going from your own project, my own backyard conservation Yarmouth Land Trust, to working with the Royal River Conservation Trust, a large organization, you sort of need to lead your expectations at the door and be willing and open to look at, at things at a new scale and, and with new objectives, lending um, your experience as you can. We define a theory of change, that is we know things are threatened in our ecosystem, in our, in our region, in our, our natural community, in our social communities. We try to define well, how would it change? How can we affect change? And how would we measure that, in fact, those strategies to affect change are working? Um, this is the next phase, which is, is very important. All of you know is developing a work plan, which is a budget. It's got a timeline. It's got deliverables along the way. And making sure, in the, in the end, that we document results, share the lessons, and adapt the plan. Now, as you see, this is a circle. And if, if it was a, a more accurate representation, there would be sub-circles going between these. Sometimes when you start defining your strategies, you realize that your objectives are actually changed. Um, so that's how all our work is in that context of conservation planning wheel, we call it. And we keep track of this. Uh, there's a lot of help out there in conservation business planning modules. This is one called Marathi, which is a Swahili word for objective. This is used by um, hundreds of partners around the world, maybe approaching um, a thousand in the next few years. Um, but what this does is it allows us to keep track of those goals. So it's obvious when you lose track along the way in your planning process, you can go back and say, what were our goals? How did we define them? How did we define whether the, uh, you know, we were meeting our objectives for uh, hardwood forest? Well, we all said that there had to be at least two per subsection. You document those, the details that are all there. Everything can go back to the plan and each of those steps along the way including a timeline and budget, can be kept track of in this open source freeware called Marathi. That's one tool. Here's some examples of goals. For instance, protected areas. We'd like to see areas, at least 25,000 areas of unfragmented forest. I'll tell you why that number in a minute. And several nearby chunks. It should be diverse as far as waters. We want to make sure that there's large connected networks. From tracking work that IFMW has done with brook trout, we know that some trout over the course of a summer may travel as much as 60 miles. Well, that's just the ones that we looked at. So you can't assume that they are the super fish. We might assume that they're the average fish, or maybe they're, for all we know, they're just the ones that have that opportunity. So 
our whole perception of how far a fish travel and where they might go needs to change. Thanks for the lights, Barbara. Surrounding forests, we want to make sure there's broad connections. Uh, we heard Mark talking about this. We heard um, others talking about how big a connection should this be from one place to another. Um, and we want to make sure that we have good buffers around our streams and forested watersheds. So now we're getting to scale, and this is a tool that we use um, which combines two distinct components. The top of this scale has to do with the scale, natural scale of natural disturbances. How do forests and wetlands and large watersheds get impacted by things that happen on a normal or, or subnormal basis? Um, we know the scale of ice storms when they wreck whole canopies of hillsides. We know that hurricanes can wipe down a broad swath of forest in a sort of swirling pattern. We know that downbursts or derechios can wipe a whole swath like there was in Massachusetts, which went for about something like 14 miles, a quarter mile wide, wiped through. You wouldn't want your reserve, your one ecological reserve area, to be a quarter mile area that got wiped out all in one downburst. So what we try to do is say that the size of the reserve should be large enough to absorb the impacts that you might expect over a 300 year time period that you would require to have a forest ecosystem, let's say, grow to its older stages, to have big logs, not only big trees, but big logs lying on the ground. Um, and you also want it large enough, the scale on the bottom, to house many populations of wide-ranging species, from things like lichen that don't require very large areas, to sawwit owls or northern goshawks, which all of a sudden push us up close to 15,000 acres. If you want viable populations, not just a pair, not just Noah's Ark, but we want at least 20 breeding pairs of goshawks, that all of a sudden takes a lot of land. So this, this scale helps us size. It doesn't mean that we have to be at 25,000 acres, but we know that if we want populations of barred owls that are self-sustaining, that we have to have at least that amount of land that has large cavity trees, that has all the prey, available for uh, a population, not just a set of individuals. So the boundaries need to be large enough to be resilient to change. They need to be able to bounce back. They need to be resistant to some extent. That is, if they're large enough, we're hoping that they can take a hurricane, they can take a derecho or a tornado, and still have surrounding forests that can fill in. And that will allow it to be adaptive. The other thing we learned to be adaptive as we started to looking at intact ecosystems around New England around the Northeast region is that those areas that are more geographically, topographically, geologically diverse tend to harbor more diversity of species and persist through many, many eons of change. The species can move in elevation, they can move from moisture to wetter areas or vice versa, then you're more likely to save a larger subset of species over time. And regardless of whether we have a five-year drought or a 10-year rainstorm, um, there'll be places in the landscape for species to find refuge. Um, you'll also find a higher diversity of species, a higher genetic diversity. If you, if you protect areas that have diversity of these underlying building materials, it's also better if they're connected both locally and regionally. We have some tools that help with all of these. Andy had mentioned his analysis of landscapes uh, of different features. We have an ecological landscape unit model, which divides the entire northeastern United States into 30 by 30 meter pixels, and then types them based on their landscape position, their geology, and their elevation. And we combine these all into creating this ecological landscape unit, which then we translate that into, well, what does that look like on the ground as far as natural communities we know? If it's very low, uh, and flat and wet, and it might be a red maple swamp. If it's slightly higher elevation and flat and wet, then it may be more likely to be a black spruce bog. Here are just some examples. This is sort of repeating Andy's slides, so I'll go quickly. This is just one area where there's um, some large sandy deposits along a stream, very common in Maine, some low boggy streams that feed into it that harbor a bunch of uh, beaver flowages, if you recognize that signature. There's some more isolated flat areas that tend to accumulate water as peatlands, broad river shores, there's hillsides, and then there's sort of the, uh, the low marshes on the sides of some of the smaller streams that harbor a slightly different type of community that may be more important for some of the fish we're looking at. The other part of this is that it's connected, so here's another tool we use. We try to say, well, we know it should be connected, but how connected and how do we gauge connectedness and measure it how would we mark it on the ground? So 
We know whether we're doing a good job or not, so we create the scale from high density development to very low density uh, land forms that are, that are very connected. And um, the human footprint map is a good example showing those levels of connectedness. Um, we can also look at those large chunks of land and look at how critters might move from one area to another. And we did this modeling with, with this, um, this guy McRae who actually worked with electrical circuitry. And by looking at the landscapes and what parts of the landscape are more or less permeable, developed a model showing where there are pinch points where critters really must go from one area to the other and where it's really going to be very tough to go from one area to another because of development. It gives us a new look at the landscape, but once again, as with the several other maps, this down east area has a lot of connectivity to the north and to the northeast, which is going to be very important as we move forward with our thinking about landscape scale planning. So maintaining those connections um, by looking at, for instance, how well forest comes to one side of the road and the other side of the road is very important. If it's just a thin little buffer on both sides and then farm fields, that may be fine for some species, not so well for others. Some connectivity is maintained through aquatic connections. So for down east, there's great existing data. Um, Andy had mentioned beginning with habitat, a lot of the data that he creates himself in the field doing inventory gets put in there as far as rare plants and best examples of ecosystems. For, you know, if you want to show someone an archetypal um, black spruce swamp or a talus acidic slope, um, we have maps which can show you those, and, and those maps are produced for everywhere in the state, as well as things like deer wintering, waterfowl, wading bird habitat, brook trout, salmon, alewives, American eel, invasive fish. There's also rainbow smelt, I should mention and tidal marsh. So all these data are available for you online. Um, use them. Not only use them, but one thing I should emphasize is you need to look at your, your tiny little spot that you might be working, but you also need to just zoom in and out to see what's around you. It really matters what's nearby, especially if it's a critter that needs, for instance, uh, vernal pool wetlands. Uh, if you're a spotted turtle or a blanding turtle, so to go from one pool to another to another, just protecting the three on your property might not do the trick. If there's a super highway on one side, but maybe not on the other, well, maybe your land protection might really focus in a different direction. Just some examples. This is the resilience analysis, which again looks at landscape diversity. And again, there's some highlights from down east, which show some very resilient landscapes because they contain a lot of features that will help lifeboat species into the future. For example, there are bands of bedrock that go through this area that are slightly calcareous. There's more calcium in them. What that means is more buffering for acidity. So as we've been plagued with acid rain in the past, and it's washed a lot of our natural buffering capacity for our streams and forests, um, some of these areas actually have a lot of calcium in the bedrock that can rejuvenate those areas and have those areas spring back. If you're going to protect areas for freshwater mussels, which build shells out of calcium, if you're going to grow salmon and brook trout, which need calcium to grow from the fry to the par and par to the smolt stage, then you're going to need more calcium in your streams. So you might want to look at connectivity to those areas that likely will persist even if things become more acidic for them, both through carb more carbon in the air, making waters more acidic, as well as acid deposition from uh, smoke sacks. Um, the other thing we looked at in our geologic layer as far as resilience for this area was the amount of sand and gravel outwash deposits. And this is very uh, important, not only for the unique communities that occur on top of these areas that are more well-drained, where you'll have a lot of blueberry barrens now, but there could be pitch pine or red pine forest just as well as other heath plants. Um, but it's also critically important for the streams that drain those areas. So where are streams that are likely to provide cold water, even if the air in, the, in, in August is reaching 100 degrees for four days at a time? Well, it's going to be those areas where there's sand and gravel outwash deposits. So those are areas, when I'm looking at stream connectivity, when I'm looking connecting habitat up and down a corridor, I might choose this corridor over that because of that bedrock geology so that these models help inform those decisions. These are some of the areas that were identified through beginning with habitat as having lots of overlapping values. Um, this is kind of a nice starting place, but I tend to like to look a lot more closely at fine scale data. Note this also doesn't incur, include a lot of aquatic uh, connectivity data for your sea run fish, your alewife, your blueback herring smelt, eel, salmon, um, as well as the resident 
fish upstream like brook trout, connected networks with brook trout. So we might add that in as a layer to look for, for starters. But these data are available on, online, and, and if your land trust or regional planning group is interested in them, you can make a request to Andy's office and get these data. Actually, is that correct? Andy, are you still here? Yes. Is it still from your office, or is it now IFNW? Uh, either one. OK, there you go. So these data are available from Maine Natural Areas Program and IFNW. Um, there's something called the Stream Connectivity Habitat Viewer, which is online as of a few months ago. And that shows a lot of these fish data, as well as I mentioned, smelt and um, tidal restrictions. And as far as condition, you really need to look at your aerial photos, fly it if you can. Lighthawk is a nonprofit organization that helps pilot fulfill their flying hours by volunteering for environmental projects. If you haven't used them, we use them all the time to check on easement conditions. Have we, do we have any timber trespass? We use them to check on the condition of forest that we may purchase, both in terms of how good do they look and how much volume is there as far as price tag. And um, they're also incredibly helpful to see where roads are being built and laid out. So if there are new roads coming in, um, that's good to know. Um, so the other thing is, is uh, if you can't get out there and fly or it's the wrong season, thematic mapper imagery, you can Google that online and get some of the latest imagery that's available to help you. For example, we were looking at a project in, in a, a rustic county that had a fantastic huge chunk of old growth forest, even a donor interested in it. When I went and looked at the TM imagery for it from last spring, it was riddled with brand new roads. That means that the foresters have already laid out their cuts and uh, buying that land all of a sudden was going to be much more expensive and had much less value to us and the donor, unfortunately. So use your imagery. When it comes to watery thing, it's, it's tougher. You can't see a lot of these streams from, from aerial imagery. And it's very important to keep streams connected for a lot of reasons. Um, both for the fish and the aquatic insects and freshwater mussels, but also for the general functioning of the stream. What we like to do is have functioning systems, not just make sure a species is there, but make sure the whole system is there to support it. Just like we like to have healthy households for children to grow up in. It doesn't matter that they're getting just food and a good education. They need the whole package. Well, streams need the whole package. They need the mineral substrate. They need wood to be moving through the system, leaves falling into it, and they need to be connected sometimes to large lakes or the ocean. So here's a host of things that need to move up and down streams. Dams and culverts do a lot of bad things. They fragment habitat. They change the temperature regime. They, uh, they change the movement of sediment and structure and nutrients and flow. So what are we doing about it? Well, for dams, we did an assessment in the Northeast. This is called the Northeast Aquatic Connectivity Project, available online. I can also send it to you. Um, not just the report, but also the data themselves. But what it shows us is that um, this is a reverse scale. Uh, red are the best places to work. Uh, I'd like to reverse the scale on this, but it's not my document. And I don't have the advanced Adobe whatever pro. But um, what this shows is that as far as the um, 33,000 whatever dams in the Northeast, the ones with the most potential to restore are in Maine, that is of the top 5%. And that is because, I thought I would put it there, but I didn't. One, the habitat is in great shape. We have a lot of forest land, which is a great context for a stream to nurture life. Two, there are very few dams. Three, the fish are already present in the system. All the species that we've had as far as fish moving up and down these streams are still there. I don't know whether uh, sea mink moved up and down streams and we don't have them in our systems anymore, they're extinct. But otherwise, we've got all our fish anyway. So we've got tools to do this. If you looked at the Penobscot, as I have done a lot of lately, um, you look at the number of dams in the system and the impacts that are having on sea and fish. You add on the culverts. Uh, notice there's watersheds. These have been filled in since I did this last field season. Um, but the culverts are a very big problem. Do all culverts block fish? No, they don't. But if you look at all the culverts out of the 10,000 um, in our database right now, if you just look at culverts and not bridges and fords and other crossings, it's something like 90% of the culverts don't pass fish under all conditions and something like 45% of them will never pass fish. So that's kind of big. If you're planning connectivity, you want to make sure that your fish are going to get from place to place. So what we do, here's the barrier map that we have so far, um, where they are and where they are problems. So you can see there's a big gap here. 
To get a field crew out doing this, um, we had great help from Downey Salmon Federation getting these, uh, the East Machias done. We'd love to fill this map in more. It really helps us prioritize where to put money in to restoration work in the short run. And there's the problem with culverts. Water runs through them quickly. It erodes the stream bed, and the stream is too low for, the, for fish to make it from this lowered stream bed into the culvert. And we've got a tool called the barrier assessment tool that helps us measure how many connected networks there are and what their lengths are. And we evaluate that in terms of habitat and, and a lot of other social values. And we like to fix them so they look more like this than this. Another tool is the active river area uh, data layer. Um, I'm going to buzz through these. These are important things. It shows us areas that are low and next to streams that are likely to contribute to stream health so that we can focus restoration dollars and acquisition dollars on lands that are most likely to affect stream health rather than maybe focusing them on areas that are, are further away or, or uh, underestimating what we should protect. I'm going to buzz through these, but all this work needs to be done in collaboration with partners. I couldn't fit all the logos on here. There are a lot more. If we had time, we'd go through the audience and get a lot more ways that different groups can help you, but there are people that can help with engineering. There are people that can help with evaluating uh, structures. There's been people who evaluate the quality of the land, the value of your timber. You already know there are people that can assess uh, land values. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can get help, and a lot of it is sort of free. Um, and there's also what we're hoping is a Clean and Safe Communities Act, Clean Water Safe Communities Act, basically a water bond, um, which has quite a bit of people supporting it. We'll hopefully be on the ballots in November which would have about $25 million for barrier restoration and about $25 million for land acquisition that would help protect drinking water and protect infrastructure. So a lot of things that we can do in terms of looking at planning for land uh, to make things uh, safer for wildlife, to have good representation, to improve our culverts for fish passage. A lot of things, and you may say, well, why do these? They're healthy things to do for our systems anyway. There are good reasons to do these things just for land protection, let alone to make things safer for our communities in the future. And sort of the jokes lie there. But that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. Perfect. You must have done a really great job. Everyone's Overload. Completely informed. Um, I do want to, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I want to tell everyone that we're sort of changing gears now. So we've heard about ecological tools uh, that we can use that will help us do a better job. Um, now we're going to hear about a very interesting um, fundraising tool, I suppose, is the way to look at it. Um, I also want to add, come on up, Mark, while I'm talking. The one thing I like about this tool, this project that Mark is going to tell us about, is it's twofold. One, it's a collaborative finance tool, but it also addresses one of the things that Josh just mentioned, and that is that we are, our backyard is part of a much, much larger ecosystem, meaning the planet Earth. And uh, so carbon offsets here can help in other locations. So Mark Barry, Executive Director of the Downey's Lake Land Trust. Thank you, Barbara, and uh, thanks for the chance to talk again today. Uh, this has been a very interesting path for us and an interesting piece of the mix of our conservation effort and it's attracted uh, attention both within the conservation community and within the forestry community. And so I'll give you a little bit of our experience with it and happy to have a good discussion about how it may or may not fit other situations. Again, there's the village of Grand Lake Stream where we work, and uh, I had the luxury of giving the overview of what we do and why earlier. This is the broad context map, and the emphasis now is on two properties. The land that we own as the Farm Cove Community Forest, manage as a community forest, the land that we hope to own as a community forest. And uh, you'll see why those are both a big part of this mix. First, what we already own, 
the Farm Cove Community Forest, we manage for community priorities of wildlife habitat, public recreation, and a sustainable timber economy. And although I did mention that this morning, it's an important uh, preamble to how we were able to do a carbon project. So here is the property again, seeing uh, the entirety of it. A uh, couple details I didn't spend time on this morning. The first acquisition was 27,000 acres north of this township line, two township lines. And this property, 6,600 acres, was a separate acquisition. Within the property, there's an ecological reserve of about 3,600 acres. Buffering that is a designated in our easements late successional management area, which is a part of the forest that we are managing toward a late successional condition. It was not late successional when we acquired it. So that's a little bit of the background of, again, what we own. The reason to enter the carbon market for us was the urgency and the opportunity of the West Grand Lake Community Forest Project. And that property was a top priority of Downey's Lakes Land Trust from our founding. Uh, the conversations with that landowner, which was a different landowner than the other projects, started at the same time. As it turned out, it became the last piece of those initial priorities uh, because of the differing situations of the landowners. Um, let me back up on that a little bit. So our situation with that conservation project is as of December, almost a year ago now, it is under conservation easement uh, held by the state. That extended our option with the current landowner, which is Lime Timber, for three more years. We have a little over two years left to raise the funds to purchase that property. And it's an interesting structure for us to find ourselves in because although we've raised money for community forest acquisition before, we've never done that after the easement was in place on the same ground. And those of you who raise conservation funding know that different funders have different motivations. For some of those funders, the motivation to support the project ended, frankly, when the conservation easement was in place. Now for us, that was also a great milestone and an important success because a lot of our priorities were met when the conservation easement was in place. We know this property won't be developed. We know there will be public access guaranteed at least to uh, Land for Maine's future standards. And it nevertheless is our priority to acquire the property and bring local stewardship to it. There are a lot of aspects of that. One piece of what we're hoping to do here is add a significant ecological reserve within that property. Other aspects are maintaining the balance of the timber economy and a sustained economic input into the community each year from timber harvest, the ability to focus on recreation opportunities and really develop those assets. All of those pieces from ecological reserve to timber economy to recreation assets are parts of how we're trying to envision and make this property the best asset for the community that we can. But none of those are guaranteed by the conservation easement and in this case the conservation easement does include a limited subdivision right. Uh, if we don't buy it, it could ultimately be as many as four properties, with four different uh, goals and objectives, none of which might relate to community priorities. So. This remains the centerpiece of our focus from the outset. It was our top priority. The reason to enter the carbon market now, instead of waiting to find out how it develops, looking at it in five years, looking at it in 10 years, was we didn't think we would ever have a more important need for capital than this project in the future of our organization. And that by entering the carbon market, at the beginning, if we were successful, we could not only generate capital for the purchase of this property, we might attract attention, which would generate additional capital. As you know, uh, sometimes being a very small organization in a very small place does not uh, make it easy to reach out to broader communities. And so those were some of the lenses that we looked at. And I'm going to come back to how we looked at the carbon market. So. 
if we wanted to get into the carbon market, how would we do that? A question, why partner with finite carbon? The way that we uh, did that is risk was one of the biggest questions for us. Uh, so was upfront cost. And one of the downsides of being at the very outset of something that was quite new, the idea that we could be paid for maintaining carbon on our property, is there was no certainty of getting to a finish line where we would actually be paid. And there were going to be big costs to start the process. With a Finite Carbon, which is a private for-profit company that has entered this niche of developing forest carbon projects, we had a business model where they would bear the upfront costs in their entirety in exchange for a portion of the offsets that are generated at the end of the road. That was attractive to us because it took away our upfront financial risk. There's still a need to negotiate what portion they get at the end, but we were not outlaying capital up front. That was important because we had no way of knowing whether we'd see anything at the end. And second, uh, they were not the only entity out there, but they had a strong team with good experience in all of the relevant areas, uh, technically and professionally and as a business. Uh, they made the best case to us. So we negotiated with them, and this will look at uh, what that timeline uh, has looked like for us but first, this is the property that we began to engage. So this is essentially the original acquisition of 27,000 acres, excluding the ecological reserve and excluding that late successional management area. The reason those are excluded, what we're doing here is called an improved forest management project. And the concept is that we are committing to maintaining a stocking of timber on the property for a very long period of time, uh, a rolling 100-year commitment, that is beyond what we are legally obligated to do otherwise. So it's entirely about whether we are doing something beyond what we're legally obligated to do. Now, we did have an opportunity to do a carbon project here on the ecological reserve and on the late successional management area. We could have done that under the regulations that were developed in the voluntary carbon market through the climate action reserve. Uh, we did look at that. We didn't feel it was a compelling thing for us to do. It was essentially allowed in a grandfathering period where they sort of let you bring in projects that you had already committed to do at the very outset, simply to get some more projects in the door. Uh, we didn't go forward with that piece. We went forward only with the piece that is legitimately a new commitment because we are not otherwise obligated to maintain a high level of stocking on the balance of that property. Now, that's what we're legally obligated to do. We wanted to increase the stocking on this property already. And I'm very upfront that our carbon project is not forcing us to do anything we didn't already want to do. We are getting compensated for what we already wanted to do. Now, some people don't necessarily like that because you, know, you can think, well, what's the point if you only pay the people that want to do it anyway? And the difference is it's a 100-year commitment and that's a very serious commitment by comparison with a management plan that could be updated every 10 years and could change every 10 years. And our board took that commitment very seriously and grappled with that question quite a lot. We grapple with it from a different lens than a lot of other landowners might as a conservation group. The types of questions we were talking about were, what if 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 70 years from now, what's really missing in the landscape and what we could really provide is more early successional habitat. We didn't think that was likely, but it was a hypothetical, given our motivation for wildlife, that this constraint of maintaining a higher level of timber stocking could run up against another priority of the board at some point in the future. 
But for the reasons I talked about earlier, and once risks were managed, it, it did make sense for us to make that commitment that our current management plan is a path that we felt it was appropriate to lock the trust into for the long term. So it was a long timeline. And this is a lot of text, but we started this effort four years ago and began evaluating the carbon offset market at that point and what opportunity we might have to participate in it. And each one of these steps was a pretty significant process for us. Before that second step of April 2010, we executed an agreement with Finite Carbon. So before that was talking to other project developers as well, actually negotiating an agreement with Finite Carbon. Uh, that spring, uh, they went through the process of developing the project and listing it with the Climate Action Reserve. Listing is a fairly preliminary step. It's, it's a two-page kind of document. Basically says, this is something we want to do. This is what we think it might be. From there on uh, was a two-year effort to do the inventory, to model the carbon project, and to get a third-party verification of all of that work. That's a very technical effort. That's an expensive effort. It wouldn't take two years now if you moved quickly, but a lot was being done for the first time when we were doing it. And that's true at multiple steps here. Um, so in the fall of 2012, the project was registered. That's the second step with the Climate Action Reserve. It was the first IFM, or Improved Forest Management Project, outside of California. And the Climate Action Reserve issued us into an account uh, nearly 200,000 compliance eligible offsets. I'm going to back up just a little bit. Climate Action Reserve is a voluntary registry. It is not a regulatory market. It's not a cap and trade market. It's a voluntary registry. But during the time that we went through this process, up until 2012, we saw the proposal of a federal cap and trade carbon market. Uh, arise and disappear. And we saw the California regulatory carbon market develop and appear. So by the time our offsets or credits were issued by the Climate Action Reserve, the California market was on the horizon. And it had been determined that this type of project would be eligible for the California market once they were ready to take projects, which they weren't at that point. Um, but during the fall, uh, we negotiated the sale of those offsets. Uh, that was, again, a complicated process, and we had one negotiation that uh, did not go anywhere, ultimately fell apart uh, with our second prospective buyer. We did negotiate a successful contract. Uh, during this past winter, we had to do a second third-party verification in order to transfer those credits from the Climate Action Reserve to the California Air Resources Board. That was part of the process that they developed. Somebody starting now would not have to go through a repetitive two-step verification process. And in March, uh, the project was listed by the California Air Resources Board, this is the regulatory market, as an early action project. Now, in this case, the listing happened when all the work had really already been done. The second verification had already been done. We had done everything on our end at that point. We expect those offsets to be issued in about an hour. Um, it took from March until October for the Air Resources Board to work through their process. We'll find out in about an hour whether we are actually issued, and if so, whether we are the only uh, forestry project or one of two. And it's most likely that we'll be one of two with a project out in California. Um, this is an extremely long timeline. There are some, I think, very significant questions that you have to look at in terms of the efficiency of this effort, but Keep in mind that for major portions of this timeline, the work was out of our hands and we were not expending uh, effort or resources, and that financially our only expense was my time 
to the extent it went into this, and a very limited amount of legal review uh, working through some contracts. So we didn't bear all of the upfront costs, which are uh, very significant. Uh, the benefits that we expect from this, uh, first, uh, initial revenue, and at the bottom, additional annual revenue. The initial revenue comes from the fact that the property already has timber stocking that is substantially above the baseline that comes from the U.S. Forest Service inventory data for our region. If you're looking at a potential forest carbon project, that's one of the first things to look at. What kind of stocking do you have on the ground relative to what's typical in your region? And it's pretty finely divided by starting with the biophysical regions that Andy had on his map, but then also by forest types within, within those. Uh, our stocking, we were confident from the very beginning of this process, was, was going to put us above those baselines. There's a question of exactly how much and how much potential revenue that might generate. But that determines whether or not you have an initial bump in offsets when you first register the project. Then, depending on your management plan for the property, if you are managing it, you have annual offsets that will come from the extent to which your, gro your growth is above what you harvest. In our case, the initial bump is really the meat of this project, but the fact that there will be an increment of annual offsets coming in is the gravy, and gravy you know, sometimes makes the meat go down easier. Um, we're looking at about one point between 1.5 and 1.6 million in that initial bump from this project on 19,000 acres. We're going to use that first to cover the long-term expenses because one of the downsides is we just signed up for a substantial reporting and verification obligation for 100 years. Uh, we think in long terms as a conservation group, as all of you do, but this was you know, a long-term cost, very much like taking on an easement obligation. We had to look at what we thought those costs would be going forward and look at how we would cover them. We are essentially endowing what we think will cover those costs out of that initial fund. There's some parts of those costs, though, where we already had efficiencies. Uh, those costs include doing a complete inventory every 12 years. Well, we already were going to need to do an inventory every 12 years. Until this, we didn't have a mechanism to fund it. So this, at one level, was funding something we were going to need to do to steward the community forest anyway. We also hope for some efficiency because we also are already a Forest Stewardship Council or FSC certified forest manager. So we are already going through an annual forest management audit that has a major reporting and tracking component. And a lot of the information uh, needed for that will feed directly into what we need to provide for the carbon reporting. And some of the companies and organizations that do those audits will be doing both. So we hope there'll be a cost efficiency there uh, and that we may have the same auditor do both things for us when they're on the ground. More exciting, and the reason we did it, is that we'll see more than a million dollars, about $1.1 million, going directly into our purchase of the West Grand property. And at one level, you know, that's cash, which is good, and it's simple and straightforward from that perspective. At another level, it's also something we're able to go to our donor prospects with, and when we're asking them to do something extraordinary, which is what we all find ourselves needing to do, we're able to say, we thought of everything else that we might be able to do to narrow this gap, and we've done that. And this is the piece that's left. So that's leveraging our existing conservation land toward additional conservation. The next step 
is we're at the beginning of a second carbon project, which is generating carbon revenue from the West Grand Lake property itself toward reducing the purchase price. And that one uh, required us to negotiate with the current landowner in addition to the other steps in order to start that project now while they own it instead of starting it after we've bought it so that the revenue can be used to help us buy it. And so that negotiation essentially said, we'd like to see this go forward. We're willing to take on the long-term obligation. They needed to be willing to take on that obligation in the event that we don't buy the property. And they needed to enable the project to start. And as a result, they're seeing some of the revenue because we're taking the long-term obligation, we're seeing the majority of the revenue be applied to reducing our purchase price. Um, we could have borrowed the money. Uh, instead of starting now, uh, that comes with a cost too. Uh, we felt the cost of giving some revenue to the current landowner facilitating this uh, was a better option than waiting to the end and seeing how much we were going to have to borrow. So we hope the second project will uh, be another million dollars, reducing what's still needed to raise. And uh, there is a fair amount of information about this up on our website already, and I'm certainly happy to take whatever questions I can. Now, Mark, what do you have for an out clause? For an out clause? So that's complicated. Um, the provisions of the program do allow you to exit by essentially buying your way out. If you have made that 100-year commitment, and at some point in the future, you decide as a landowner that you want out for whatever reason, you can buy your way out. There's a substantial penalty and a lot of uncertainty there. And the penalty changes over time, and I don't remember the exact tracking. But if we wanted to do that, say, next year, it, it, we roughly would have to pay two to one on the current value of offsets next year. If we wanted to do that 70 or 80 years from now, we'd be paying something like 1.2 or 1.3 to one on the current value of offsets then to buy our way out. So that's if we made a choice to get out of this program. There is a structure that has a cost. Now, there are a lot of complications to this, and there are others about what happens if something out of our control causes a loss of timber stock. So fire is the most obvious choice, but an insect infestation could do it as well. And that is managed within the program using a buffer pool. So we had to contribute some of our offsets into that buffer pool so does every other project. It's essentially an insurance program where we are protected against something out of our control that would uh, reduce our stocking in the future. Spencer. In terms of um, using existing conservation credits on existing conservation to fund additional conservation, have you done any back and below calculations to see how big a property you need to start with to perpetuate this? At, at current to, market rates. To for, perpetuate uh, it or to make it a viable project? Well, for instance, you could imagine uh, if you had a big enough property to start with, you sell the credits on it to fund the next piece, or a substantial portion of the next piece, you sell the credits on that to fund a portion of the next piece. Well, um, I, I don't think it's likely in Maine to ever really play out so neatly that you could really fund the next property with the previous one and start a chain reaction. Um, the market would have to develop quite a lot before that would really work in terms of not having a substantial component of money coming from somewhere else. But in terms of what does it take to get over the hurdle of the startup costs, it depends on your stocking and it depends on your size. If you have an extremely large property, 100,000 acres, your stocking only needs to be slightly above your regional average for this to make sense. If you have a four to 5,000 acre property, 
your stocking needs to be significantly to substantially above that regional average. And if it's a several hundred acre to thousand acre property, it better be exceptional or it just won't pencil out because your cost of going through all of the inventory, a lot of that cost is, is really fixed uh, in terms of the modeling cost and everything else and not dependent on acreage. So there's an economy of scale, um, but it, it's interrelated with your timber stocking. Andy. Thank you, Mark. You did a great job at uh, distilling a pretty complex topic down into components that we can understand. Uh, my question is, now that you have, have broken the ice and taking this step um, in your conversations with other nonprofits or large landowners in Maine, do you see uh, others following this path? Yes, but how many and when uh, I think is a very open question. I mentioned that there is real interest from the conservation community. There are a limited number of conservation landowners that have forest properties of a size for it to be viable, and then it will depend on their motivations. Uh, in the private landowner realm, I have had a number of significant private landowners in Maine come to me to gain from our perspective, and I know that they're looking at it. I don't know that any are uh, close to executing, but they are looking at it, and um, you know, a lot will depend what the market does. So, the market on these offsets now, if they're California compliance offsets, is somewhere above ten dollars a ton. There are some people who think it will go far higher. Uh, there are other people that think the program will go away completely and crash and burn. Um, if it does go substantially higher, it's going to make sense, obviously, for a lot more people. What? Uh, Whitfield's New England Forestry Foundation. We took the plunge um, a couple of years ago and are working with finite carbon as well. But we did it on a 2,100 acre block in New Hampshire that, in fact, is under a forever wild conservation easement. While that window of opportunity was there, we, we did it because uh, we knew we'd never be harvesting on that property. What we found is the cost of establishing those permanent plots, which we undertook, we did it, some of those with our own staff, some with consultant foresters, um, but the cost of doing that was pretty high, but the cost of getting verification of those permanent plots was double what it actually cost, us, it cost us to establish them. Um, we're going to the board, our board, next week with a recommendation that of the 43,000 tons available out there, we know that you, you really have to set aside 32%, 15% commission to finite carbon when those, those offsets are actually sold, and 17% for that buffer pool, the insurance program that you spoke of. Um, but what we decided to do was to, the recommendation to the board is to sell at least enough of those offsets to create internally a fund that at a four or five percent yield will cover our, our sunk costs in the project now and also cover the, the future costs of remeasuring all those permanent plots on the established schedule, which is, is it 12 years? 12 years for full re-inventory, six years of uh, verification based on a desk review. Right, but in the end, it, it was, it's going to turn out to be a lot of work and substantial upfront costs for what is found money, because in, in this case, in our case, we couldn't have been harvesting timber on the property anyway. Right, so. and I should have mentioned in response to Andy's question, the Appalachian Mountain Club has done something quite similar uh, on one of their ecological reserve properties, uh, and they will uh, most likely remain within the voluntary market uh, because it is not eligible for compliance with the easement that's already on the property. Um, you know, I think for us, one of the other questions in working with my board was how we as a local nonprofit in Eastern Maine interact with a global issue and a national and California political environment and 
what worked for my conversation with my board was to essentially focus entirely on our mission and leave the global question aside. And for some people who you know, are inclined to think globally, that could almost sound distasteful. But this came down to a fiduciary responsibility where the board said, we have an opportunity here that if we can manage the risk, it will help us advance our local mission, and therefore we should do it. And ultimately, the question was that simple. The global perspectives were not part of our decision structure. OK, thank you, Mark. OK, so we're going to spend uh, the remaining time, or at least the next 30 minutes. Anyway, um, what we're going to do from this point is have a group discussion. Now, I realize that, good. I realize that this is a large group, but that's OK. We're all just going to be flexible. Um, I want to remind everyone that the purpose of Durin is the Down East Research and Education Network, is to promote collaborations and communication. And so the question is, since we're the sponsor of Convergence, what is it that Darren can do? What is it that we can do as a network? What is it that we can do as individuals? What are uh, the gaps? What are we doing well? What are the gaps? And what can we do? So I'm going to have Sherry. Uh, be the note keeper, and I do need a volunteer to um, manage the other microphone. Sorry, this is PC. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll help. <laughs> I um, can I get someone to on this side of the room to volunteer to? Um, Abe is going to do it. Thank you. So our first question is, based on everything that we've heard so far, what are we doing well? None of us have an answer to that one. We're, 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 Barbara, I, I wanted to ask a more general question. And that's yes. that um, when I've heard all the, I'm, I'm not a land trust person, but a lot of it is about land trust. When, I, when I've heard all these talks today, the things that's impressed me over and over again, is the role both in front and behind the scenes that Maine Coast Heritage Trust has played. I mean, they've been just a marvelous resource for a lot of people. And in some ways, Maine Coast Heritage Trust is doing some of that networking among land trusts, it seems, it seems like to me, just from an outsider looking in. And so I guess part of my question is, how does Darren's role differ from the role that Maine Coast Heritage Trust has in bringing together these groups and coordinating activities within that? So what's really Darren's role in addition to what Maine Coast Heritage Trust is already doing to collaborate and to bring together land trusts? Uh, well, I can answer as the director of Darren. I can say that um, one difference is that Darren is not just about land trusts. Okay. First of all, Darren is also about conservation organizations, uh, as well as academic institutions, as well as research institutions, also agency staff, biologists, etc. So, uh, first of all, we're a much, much larger network. Okay, that's number one. Um, number two, I think that um, I can't speak for Maine Coast Heritage Trust as Marty's still here. Oh, okay, sorry. So, <laughs> you're hiding on me. So I can't speak for them, but I'm sure that they can speak for themselves. But I don't want to go too far down this road, okay? They are a major land trust, okay? And I, I just want to emphasize that our roles are, are different. We can sort of go maybe where they may not go. All right, because we are a network and we're not an organization. So, um, do you want to comment on that briefly? I am Betsy Hamm. I'm the director of land protection for Maine Coast Heritage Trust, and I I think that we have overlapping roles, and that's good. Uh, overlapping and cooperative roles, and 
Boy, the more the merrier. Uh, you cannot get enough coordination, cooperation, uh, and so forth in, in the field of uh, conservation uh, and community engagement. Uh, so I, I just don't think there's, there's not a, a finite universe. Uh, we can all, working cooperatively is, is clearly the way to go. Okay, so let me get back to uh, the question at hand. What is it that we're doing well? And I will start it off by saying the one thing that I've learned through the panel discussion that we are doing very, very well is at least within our own organizations, okay, that was, that was made very, very clear to me during the panel discussion, within our own organizations, we are in fact doing um, more collaborations or more collaborative work, okay? Um, it, uh, I think, the Machias project was a, a very good example. There's multiple um, land ownerships, um, multiple organizations, agencies, etc., involved, and so we are doing a certain level of that. Um, is there anything else that you think that we're doing well? Well, I, my name's my name's Mike Day. I'm uh, I'm a uh, research scientist. Uh, Professor at the University of Maine, and also I um, am on the uh, the uh, governing board or whatever we call it for the uh, for the Darren. And I think the the real the real impact of Darren is the ability to bring together researchers and educators and the land trust base. I mean, so and that was kind of why we formed that organization was to uh, to enable the uh, the potential users uh, for education and research of the land trust land to have a vehicle that we could communicate with the land trusts on a on a broader basis. I will also add that um, the other thing that I've learned today is that we do have tools. Okay, so this I want to start out by pointing out what we have. We have an enormous amount of ecological and GIS tools been made clear. We've also been uh, told all about a really uh, challenging financial tool, the carbon offsets, but it's still very fascinating. And I also want to remind everyone that we have a very, very high percentage of conservation organizations, um, research institutions, okay, in our region. We have one of the highest concentrations, considering our population, okay, which is pretty small in Washington County and even in Hancock County, but yet we have an enormous amount of, of uh, conservation entities. So any other comments about what we are doing well? Am I like the only positive person in the room here today? <laughs> I am so glad to have full. All right, um, then let's talk about gaps. What is it that we're not doing or what is it that we could be doing better? Um, <clears throat> I'm Dale Wheaton. I represent the Woody Wheaton Land Trust in uh, Eastern Maine. I, I think as, as, as we all get together at one of these venues and pat ourselves on the back and say, go get them, boys. We're doing great. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the failures is to look at the obstacles to further collaboration. And, and one of the uh, one of the obstructions and, and one of the conflicts that that might prevent us from getting together. And uh, <clears throat> I had a little discussion with uh, Alan Hutchinson at lunchtime that that in looking out at the challenges to some of the conservation successes that we have, as you look out into the future, you find that that the greatest jeopardies and challenges to some of those successes you had come from directions that you never ever envisioned and often from whom you felt were your friends. And um, <clears throat> although many of us, many of we folks in the land trust business agree on 90% of our issues, we disagree on 10% and sometimes those are, 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 are very important. An example of that is, is, is wind power as it has uh, 
suddenly assaulted our landscape in northern and, and eastern Maine. Um, first wind came to uh, our land trust and offered us $20,000 uh, just as a support. And if, if you're familiar with the film The Promised Land, you know what the mentality behind that is. And they go in and they buy out the Snowmobile Club and the Boy Scouts and the school board and the school and, and to set the table. And, and wind power is something that strikes each one of us differently, but it is very divisive. And it and is sufficiently divisive to cause us as land trusts not to cooperate. And, and that's merely one example. Um, so I, I, and I could certainly go on, but I, I, think, I think it's imperative for you folks to to try to, 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 to recognize, first of all, that there are philosophical differences. Um, I praise Mark Berry and, and his initiative that he's taken with his board. And at the same time, I sit here very troubled, troubled thinking that, wow, did he sell his soul in order to accomplish what he wanted to do that was in the headlights? You know, you know that, that's a question that each one of us would have to, to ask ourselves whether or not we're in violation of some other principle in, in trying to accomplish what's right there in front of us. And, uh, you know, for, for me personally, I would have to contemplate it a while longer before I engaged in that. That's a good point. Anybody else have um, anything to add or another example of a challenge? Jacob? Jacob Andy Sandy, Downey Salmon Federation. I think that the sort of land acquisition that we've done a really good job at collaborating and it, and it continues to grow, particularly in, in just raising money. But I think in the education realm, I think we've, and, and it's building all the time, but I think we're falling short in terms of really finding creative ways to bring money into education. Conservation is great, but still, you know, in terms of putting aside land, but in reality, Education is the key to all of this stuff. And until we take that really seriously and invest a large portion of our money in that, we're fighting a losing battle. So are you suggesting that we need to invest more in education? I, I, that we're not I, doing enough? Well, I think we need to find creative ways. We'd all like to do it, but I think it's much easier to get money from people to buy a piece of land than to put money into education programs. And I think that that's an eternal problem we have you know, nationwide and, and right down to the really basic stuff. We we're just talking about culverts, and it's a classic example. We don't have that basic literacy culture-wide, and until we have that, we're gonna be fighting that indefinitely. And I think that we still are, even as a group of people who knows, under-investing. And it's, it's not just children, it's adults. But don't get me started. Okay, Norm in the back. Hi, uh, Norm Famous um, with the uh, Brook Island and the Eastern Maine Conservation Initiative, the land trust that works with Brook. Anyway, um, what I could see here, especially this afternoon, with various presentations, they were really presenting tools. And if we could have workshops combined with this, for example, the layers that the state has as they apply to maybe an individual project or, or whatever, and then the uh, Mark Berry's work uh, would, would be interesting to explore further. And even wind power, having a wind power representatives here, if we could sign waivers not to kill them or anything, <laughs> or shoot them or let the air out of the tires, whatever. But uh, that may exchange information back and forth in a positive way, hopefully. I will just say, in response to Norm, that's wonderful to hear because don't we hear the same thing? You need to have the hydro power people at the table as well when we talk about the river stuff. So, yes. Uh, Jim Levitt again. I just want to respond to the 90-10 the point that you brought up, which is a very good point. Um, there's, a, there's kind of a poster child large landscape conservation initiative out in Montana called the Blackfoot Challenge. That's protected a large part of a million acre valley, the Blackfoot Valley, which is the valley in which the book A River Runs Through It was written. 
and that river had become degraded and the people, the ranchers mostly who live there, have worked with the state and the federal government and Nature Conservancy over 30 years to bring that valley back. And they have a, a saying that they constantly say, which is let's work on the 80% of the things that we can agree on and let's leave the other 20% to work on another day. There are, I think one of the things that, that as you go from an emerging large landscape conservation community to one that's uh, actually conserving land and doing other things is to remember that there's, there actually is more to do than just protect land as a community. Invasives is a good place to begin. This is a community where there are, there are a lot of aquatic invasives that are either right over the horizon or here already that we could all be collaborating across territories to, uh, to address. Um, it's true with managing wildlife corridors in such a way that uh, they have good connectivity and culverts is, a, is another good example of that where you don't just educate everybody but you work together with one another to make sure that along a particular corridor we've got all the culverts right so that we're not keeping fish from going up and down that waterway. And I could go on for 20 minutes about the different ways there are to collaborate across landscapes to achieve important conservation objectives. Certainly protecting land is a big one. It's dear to my heart. But it's not the only thing in the 80% that everybody agrees on to work on. So broadening the scope of collaboration is one of those things I think you could put on the list. Well, uh, I'm Andy Burt, and I'm from Edgecombe. And um, one of the things that I'm interested in is I've been spending a lot of time with people who are developing uh, a, a food plan for the whole state, which is that how are we going to feed ourselves and around agricultural land. And um, I'm struck that this organization has opportunities with people who are working both from the food perspective uh, in, on the seas as well as on the land, that um, it could be a really valuable conversation about how to be uh, working together in those realms. I like that. And thank you very much. I'm Abby Pond from the St. Croix International Waterway Commission, and I'm new to the region, so forgive me if I say anything that's already been said. Um, but uh, someone touched on it earlier in the presentation. It would be great if Darren could act as um, a source of and a director to um, all of this great information and all of the tools that are out there. Uh, so if I need to find information, it's the place that I go to first to find it. It might not be that you have that information, but you know where I can find it. Tor. Um, one thing uh, that I've had a few conversations about here today uh, is that we need to do better getting across the estuaries, um, connecting the um, freshwater and land-based uh, conservation work to the marine conservation work. And uh, there are lots of species and connectivity in terms of food systems uh, in the ecosystem that are critically important and we need to do more, especially to get the fisheries conversation going, um, especially considering how critical it is to the economies of downstream. Um, and I would just like to add to Torres, if we're still on the topic of what is needed, what are the gaps, and it's come up several times, um, so we have this gap with marine um, fisheries. Um, we need to make that connection. We need to improve planning. We're doing a great job of planning on land, and maybe we need to start doing a better job of it um, in at least near shore waters. OK, so this is a great segue into what can Darren do? OK, what are some next steps that Darren can do? Um, we've heard at least 
two things, okay, so more, let's break, we're on the same page, offer some workshops, okay, to help people uh, provide more tools for collaboration, and we've also heard about um, being a, a better clearing house, if you will, for information and tools. Um, so that's at least two things that Darren can do. Um, what are some of the other things, not that we are necessarily going to do all of them, um, but if we um, have a lot of ideas, then you know we can basically prioritize them and, and choose one or two of them and move forward. Any other suggestions? Now I'm going to throw this back to Torah. Okay, so you just said, all right, you just said we need to do a better job. Yep. Okay. Sure. This. How <laughs> how should we do that? Um, actually, one thing that came up uh, was maybe making. That, those kind of connections, the theme of next year's conference. Um, and, and we were just talking about the fact that there actually are a lot of people doing this kind of work who all know each other, but those folks don't know these folks. And so maybe getting more of, of that cross-pollination um, uh, going, making sure they're part of the network and they're able to communicate via the network and maybe even um, making those connections as, as part of the conference next year is something that's come up. If we had a conference that was, uh, well, let's, let's just say that included or emphasized um, estuarine and marine environments, would the land-based people still come? Raise your hand if you would come. <laughs> Get you, okay. But <laughs> would you come or not? Would I come? No, I'm talking to the person in front of you. Oh, okay. <laughs> you were like, I don't know. Um, we do that uh, on species. Okay, yes, you guys don't count. Are you kidding? Yeah, they're forgetting. Just, yeah. <laughs> no, you people don't count. Okay, any other um, comments or uh, questions or contributions? What, what can we do? Um, we do have one suggestion for a theme for next year. Um, any other suggestions? As a relatively new graduate student, my name is Brianne Lewis. I'm from the University of Maine, um, who does my research in Downey's Maine. Um, this was supposed to be held in conjunction with the Acadia National Park Symposium, and I was really interested to see what other research projects are being conducted in the Downey's area. And I don't know, I've never been to anything associated with this organization, but do you guys have um, a symposium just for you know, research projects that are being done in Downey's Maine? I'd be really interested in something like that. Um, okay, but you raise a very good point. You are absolutely correct in your assessment um, that we uh, are supposed to be interested in, in research, and we are. Um, we just, the, Second, first and second convergence conferences, okay? We did focus on research and we encouraged people to um, have posters, okay, about their research. And that was partly what um, the Acadia Symposium was supposed to do, okay? So we lost that component, okay? However, you raise a very good point, and I, I, I want to make a note of this, but I'm not really sure where I'm going. Um, we do need to promote research. We do need to document the research that's going on. And we are still trying to figure out what is the best way to do that, okay? Um, it, is, it is on our mind. We are thinking about it. And if anybody has a solution, that's what this dialogue is about, okay? And if you go home and you think about it, email me. Uh, and, and I open that up to everybody. Um, who built, oh, I'm sorry, Ted. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ted Ames, Penobscot East Resource Center. Uh, I just wanted to uh, 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 extend Tora's perception of needing to connect uh, marine and aquatic systems with what's going on with, with forestry and land conservation. Uh, success of land conservation and restoration efforts really do hinge on having healthy rivers. And if you want a healthy river, you've got to have 
and protect that estuarine and coastal area that's associated with it. And that's an area where real collaboration between marine interests and river, uh, et cetera, interests are vital. If we don't get it, then the, uh, a major part of river restoration goes down the tube. It's, uh, it's certainly worthy of thinking about next year's convergence. Thank you, Ted. Bill. So Bill Labick, Highstead, and, and uh, again, really appreciate being here and seeing how you all work together and function. And it reminds <laughs> me that uh, reminds me that a lot of partnerships are somewhere in between a loose network and a more formal partnership. And what they are in, along that continuum is in part based upon a cost-benefit analysis that every partner does. It has to, has to uh, get to at some point in time in the life of the partnership, and that is, what, am I, what do I want, and what am I willing to do to get it? Uh, everybody has to, to ask that question and answer that question for themselves. But you might think about, as a, as a partnership, as a you call yourself a network, and is that enough for what you want to do? Well, all I'm hearing so far is a convergence, talking about what you want to do, and you're talking about the next convergence. So just I'm curious, is, the, is there what happens between convergences? How, I would be interested in knowing how many of you are currently collaborating? Are there clusters of collaborators in the landscape? Um, if someone's interested in a particular, has a particular idea, an innovative idea, who, who in this group can help facilitate, make that happen? Those are my questions. Those are very good questions. And I, I just want to educate Bill for just a minute. We're only three years old. <laughs> um, but he raises a very good point because at three years old, Okay, and at some point, you, you know, you look at your organization and you say, where are we going? And that's exactly what this conversation is about. Um, I will also say that according to the panel discussions, um, it does look like people are collaborating in clusters. And so the next question is, how much do we want to broaden this, as Jim has suggested, how much farther do we want to we have another comment? Yes, um, Dave Grunzel, University of Maine, a master's student. Um, just to follow up with my colleague in front of me, um, I was kind of curious about, uh, and maybe we could get some feedback from the audience, uh, the role of outside researchers um, in, in either the strategic planning of the land trust or anything moving forward. I know. Some of you seem to be large enough where you have in-house research going on, and that's fantastic. Um, but what about you know those of you that may be small enough, but you have aspirations for what what you want to do? Can you um, you know get in touch with the university or other organizations and kind of fit this model and work within this network to get some of those things accomplished? Anybody from the land trust want to respond to that? Uh, I would like to. Uh, East Remain Conservation Initiative and Rogue Island reporting now. <laughs> uh, the EMCI, uh, this is the response to that last statement. Uh, they offer several thousand dollars per grant. They can come up to 6000 and probably give out ten to $15,000 a year for uh, the support studies, especially in the Machias Bay area, but they can broaden out a little bit. Uh, not really speaking for them, but I think their arms could twist it gently. But uh, they have funded, I think, over 40 studies in their 17 years of existence. Uh, some applied. Uh, Brian Beal you know, had did work for CD plan flats, like helping the towns. They've also help uh, historical societies with uh, directors and historians as well. But anyway, uh, so there is opportunities there and they're having trouble getting uh, 
uh, drawing attention to them, but it may be because it's such a small amount of money for a hardcore researcher. But the other point I was going to make was, uh, why don't we have two of these conferences a year? Would think in the spring would be an optimum time, especially for doing collaborative research or collaborative studies among land trusts in the summer, and, and there's going to be a lot of enthusiasm. That enthusiasm coming into a field season, now we're waning a little bit coming out of the, the end of the field season. So spring may be a time to have workshops, uh, poster, uh, product, or poster display from researchers, or whatever. Uh, so that's just my thought. Thank you, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, any other comments? Well, this is for, did we, what? Okay. <laughs> All right, well, um, I'm gonna turn this over to, to um, Jim Levitt, our keynote speaker, who's going to summarize today with some final thoughts, brief final thoughts. And before I pass this over to him, I want to take this time before people start heading out. I want to thank every one of the speakers Okay, who have traveled here to um, entertain us for the day, um, and also to the participants who have provided so much discussion. Um, this final discussion is very important for me um, to know where to take you, and I hear at least three themes, okay? Practical workshops, some technical um, assistance, um, and some emphasis on research. I do want to remind everyone that in between convergences, okay, <laughs> uh, we are going to initiate the economic impact study. And I, we did not talk about it too much today because it was the topic of last year's convergence, but uh, the study that we have raised funds for uh, is to look at the economic impact of conservation in this region. So it would look at the impact of conservation institutions, okay? Um, you know, the number of employees, the salaries, um, also the projects, what are the benefit of the projects? What is the, the value of the land? What's the value of recreating on the land? What's the value of research on the land? Um, so that is a huge, huge project for us, okay? Meaning me. And <laughs> uh, so that's what I'll be spending my time on. But I do, and we have talked about this as a steering committee, we do want to return to this um, trying to organize and coordinate and share research. So I at least have those themes, and I want to thank everyone for providing that. I also want to encourage, if you have any ideas, just please email me. Everybody who knows me knows I'm right there, okay? You just email me or call me. I'm right there for you. Okay, so I'm going to turn this over to Jim Levitt, and I want to thank everyone. From the day. Barbara, exactly. Yeah. I, I want to second that. Barbara did a tremendous amount of work and has for several years to bring these together, and congratulations. This was a great session. I want to actually turn the, que the last question back to Barbara because you have an idea about what we could do next as a group to advance uh, management objectives. Do you want to enunciate that now or you want to wait? She'll wait, okay. She's got a big idea. I'll just leave it there. Um, all right, well, so um, in five hours and 14 minutes, I need to be at home in Boston watching the baseball game, so I will make this brief. <laughs> uh, excuse me? Are you flying home? We're going to drive fast. We're going to drive fast. Three of us in a car, we're going to take turns. You know, we've got snacks in the car. Okay. Um, very briefly, what we did today was I got the chance to stand up here and talk about a big idea. Uh, Bill Labick got to follow me and talk about how some people implement that big idea. Um, we had an array of local land trusts here that told us in great detail how they have and how they want to in the future collaborate, uh, 
maybe not on a whole regional scale, but on a um, intra-local intra -local scale to get stuff done. We had great presentations from both the state and PNC on the level of sophistication of the tools that they're using to do some of this large landscape conservation planning. Um, we had Mark Berry have the audacity. Is Mark still in the room? He left. To tell us that he signed a hundred year agreement. That's a brave thing to do, I think. But good. And we we had this, this final discussion. And I just want to make a brief comment on the final discussion, which is that you get what you manage for. Over the last three years, what Darren has managed for is to have a series of really well-organized and thoughtful meetings. And you will have more thoughtful meetings as we go forward. Um, there's a point at which you may have to choose to set your sights on a particular objective on the landscape that you can collaborate on together to get done. That's different than organizing for meetings. Um, so, you know, Tom Sadar was talking about his, uh, his Scudic to Donnell Pond unit vision. Someone else was talking about the Pinal, I was talking about, and somebody else as well, was talking about the tremendous opportunity that is afforded all of you with the historic opening of the Penobscot River. Um, you've got the series of uh, places that don't light up the sky at night that you enjoy that are different from any place else in the East Coast of the United States. I know for a fact that some of you are already talking to one another about how do you actually address some of these big ideas? How do you address them in terms of land conservation? How do you address them in terms of stewardship? How do you address them in terms of invasive species? How do you address them in terms of local economic development? There are more topics than that, but that's a good group to begin with. Um, th there, will, there will come a point at which you're going to have to decide if you want to continue to manage yourselves to have more really good meetings and think about this and then have the, the on-the-ground objectives kind of seep out of these meetings, which is what's happening and which is a good thing. I'm not trying to be critical here. Or whether or not you want to be explicit about doing strategic plans on some on-the-ground man management objectives through these kind of meetings. Um, both work. Both methods work as ways to get large landscape scale conservation done. But I, I want to return to what I said at the beginning, which is you get what you manage for. So if you choose a couple of explicit objectives over time, you may surprise yourselves at what you can do collectively um, with your eyes directly on the objective rather than coming at it uh, in a more indirect fashion. Um, I, I will close by saying that I have had the chance to work with many of the people in this room on a lot of projects. And I'm pretty confident that either way you choose to do this, there's going to be large landscape scale conservation that happens in this region over the next 20 or 30 years. You know, maybe it'll be MCHT that's the lead actor in that, as somebody suggested. Maybe it's TNC, maybe it's the Conservation Fund, maybe it's Darren, maybe it's an organization that doesn't exist yet. But it's going to happen. And I look forward to being part of the adventure. So thank you all, and uh, go Red Sox.